Sakura! I land. Kill. Kill him. Okay, my chess friends, welcome to this chess video. And I have a very interesting game in fact. It's been some time since I have inflicted upon you any of my own games. So I'm going to do that now, so be prepared. My opponent is rated 1800 and he opens with c4. I open with knight f6. I have a very simple system of playing against the English. I simply put my pawns on these light squares. And I prepare d5 with c6. Please d4, d5, and we have transposed into the Slav. And here he plays a move that I don't like. He plays the move c5. And normally in the Slav what happens is white puts pressure on the centre. And we're forced to take away from the centre and prepare the move either c5 or the move e5. e5 is usually much harder to get in. But by playing this move c5, my opponent essentially makes the decision for me. I mean, there's only really one way for me to equalise here, and that is to play the move e5. Putting two beautiful pawns in the centre, side by side. All I need to do is think how I can prepare it. I plan knight b to d7, queen to c7, and e5. Very simple chess. Knight f3, queen c7, and nothing can prevent e5 now. We have e3, e5, and takes, 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 and takes. And not only have I equalised, but I have a very slight advantage. You can see that this pawn here is better than its counterpart here. And this gives me some very slight space advantage in the centre. I mean, it's not, it's not much, but it's better than nothing. Queen to d4, man. I thought my opponent was wishing out here, but I think in retrospect it's actually a very decent move. And would you take the queen if you had the black pieces? Well, I suppose there are pros and cons. If I take, maybe he takes back with the pawn. Well, it frees up this dark squared bishop here. And I don't see why that I should improve my opponent's position for him. On the other hand, if I do take here and he retakes with the pawn, maybe this pawn will be a weakness on d4, I don't know. Either way, I, de I declined to take the queen and I played knight to d2. My idea is very simple, I'm simply attacking the c5 point with two pieces. My opponent defended. I played bishop to e7. My idea is to bring the bishop to f6. My opponent went back with the knight. And here I decided to play queen takes d4. Maybe this bishop can come to this beautiful diagonal here. 
with a pawn on d4, well, it's a very pure piece. castle. My opponent plays knight to g3. I play knight to f6. And we have f3, which is a very, very interesting choice. You can see that it curtails the freedom of my knight here on f6. But it also weakens the white position. You can see that this square here is very weak now, as is this square here. And this, in whoops, this entire color complex is rather weak simply by this little innocuous pawn move here f3 I mean it doesn't look much now right but you will see as the game goes on just how important this is here I play a move that I don't like I play h5 I think a better move would have been maybe a5 something like that Undermining these queenside pawns, which are easy targets. But anyhow, I played h5. And the reason that it's not very good is it weakens this square terribly. And if this bishop finds a home here, it'll be an awesome piece. My opponent replies in kind. I play rook to e8. Bishop to e2. Bishop drops back. Which gives the rook some scope. On the e-file, bishop to f4 and b6. Finally, I try and undermine these pawns. My opponent castles here. <clears throat> and I notice that there is a relationship between the bishop and the knight. Because this knight cannot move because this bishop is attacked. And what that means is it gives me time to attack the h-pawn. And I conceive of the idea of knight to h7 and bishop taking here. The problem with it is, is that this h-pawn is not really that important. It's not really a big deal. I mean, really, what is it doing? It's not doing anything, really. And, but this is my idea, and I carry it out. So I played knight to h7. We have bishop to d3. The bishop's got to move so that white can regain the material. I take, take. I play here. The knight goes back. And you will look at this now. It's very, very weak. Look at all these dark squares around the black king. They're very, very weak. It's unfortunate for white because the rook is on this file. You cannot defend with something like bishop to e3. So I simply attack this pawn and there's only really one def I mean maybe the bishop could come here. I don't know. I doubt it. And so he plays knight to e2. And we have a very simple tactic. I wonder if you can see it. There's only one defender of the d4 pawn. It's this knight here. And if we remove the defender, with rook takes, bishop takes, well, we can win a pawn. And we regain back the exchange. And we now have a beautiful pass pawn that's unopposed along the d-file. Okay, white has these two beautiful bishops. There's no question about it. And my pieces, well, look at this knight. It's in outer Mongolia. I mean, I don't think it could actually be, be on a worse square. Is there a worse square? I mean, maybe this square is worse here, but it's not that much worse. This is doing nothing, and this is not even in the game. So... I play bishop to e6 with the idea of simply bringing my rook into the game. Opponent plays this cunning move here. His idea, of course, is to come in here. Well, I challenge it and the bishop goes back. Here I play f5. We have rook to e1. And now I'm going to have real problems here with the e7 square. 
Whoa. This bishop's going to come here. The rook's going to come here. And I'm going to get toasted. The only way I can defend this is by blocking the e file. So I plan king and bishop here, blocking the e file. King f7, bishop to d6, and bishop to e6. And I've successfully blocked the e-file, but it allows this move here, bishop to e6, with the obvious idea of coming in here to b7. I can defend everything. I mean, rook to e8 looks like me to be a kind of only move. Bishop b7, and the bishop drops back, and everything is defended. And here, my opponent blunders. He plays, thankfully, the move b5. When someone offers you a rook like this, and you can see no compensation for it, well, you take it. He takes, and I simply give back the material. Like this here. Defend my pawn, and the bishop goes to e4, maybe with ideas of trying to bring this pawn forward. But it's got a snowball's chance, because I chop it off. Takes. And although there is a knight and a rook verse two bishops. These bishops on this open board are pretty awesome. Try and save my doomed pawn. Bishop to d3, b3, sorry. King to e6 and bishop to d4. And this contains a threat, of course. Bishop takes knight and bishop takes pawn, winning the pawn. But I don't think it's a particularly good idea for white. I mean, the two bishops are powerful themselves, but a rook against the bishop, I don't think. I mean, maybe it's a draw, I don't know, but I wouldn't fancy it. Here I play knight to h5, g3, and here I play a move that I like, although the computer doesn't like it. I play the move f4. If white advances, my knight goes my knight will go here, and here, and maybe here. <laughs> Not in that order. So, white takes. I take back, and he takes with, and he moves the king to g3. Now take a look at this position here. You can fork the king and the bishop. But when you do, the king will come to f2 and he will fork the rook and the knight, which will be here. But it is in fact a trap because the position that results is a winning endgame for black. Take this out. I realise that I am about to be forked and lose a piece, but I'm prepared to give up the knight and the rook for the two bishops because this here is a winning endgame. I can play e5. I have the opposition and a winning endgame. There is no way these pawns here can ever advance because these pawns here will simply chop them. My opponent plays e2, I play, yep, put my king in front of the pawn. I'm threatening to bring my king here and march this pawn up the board. As well as the b3 pawn, my opponent plays d3. Play e5 and white is running out of moves. have f4, king to e4. And the game is essentially lost. My opponent plays e3, I take, 
and he resigns because there's nothing that can prevent one of these pawns from queening. They're simply too far apart for the king to do anything. So a very, very interesting game from my perspective. This move here, it gave me some very, very slight advantage in the centre. And after we take queens, this became a little weak. And it's this little move here, it looks really innocuous, but I mean, it does weaken these squares here. And we're able to find a little tactic that we can exploit. The weakness of the king, the weakness of the d4 pawn. And we just simply remove the defender. We win a pawn, get back the exchange, and we're doing all right. So I hope you enjoyed that, my friends. Um, it was certainly a very enjoyable game from my perspective. It's always good to review our games to see our thought process, what we could have done better, what we like, what we didn't like, why we chose certain moves over others. And in this way, chess becomes a learning experience. So I thank you very much for taking the time. And I sincerely wish you well with your own chest. Take care and goodbye.